Please now join me in welcoming Dr. Vincent Harding, who will talk with us briefly this morning and further engage us throughout the week. His talk now is Loved Into Life, a personal testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much, friends. It is good to be back on this campus. More than half a century since I first came here. I come as one who does not like to lecture or preach. I come as one who takes very seriously the words of Hannah Arendt, who said some years ago, it is when we are in dialogue that we are most human. I need to be human, and I need you to be human. And so I only hope that this morning I can begin to put forward my part of the dialogue. And I promise that anywhere you catch me on campus, I will be available to hear your part of the dialogue, your questions, your concerns, your disagreements, your songs, whatever. I am incomplete without knowing what's in your heart. So please understand this as my opening of the dialogue. And as my brother Mark just said, I've chosen to open the dialogue by sharing with you what may be the title of the autobiography that I'm working on, very, very hard sometimes. <laughs> Obviously not this time. Loved into life. I want this morning to testify to you about some of the people who have given me life by the giving of their love. I do that to remind myself and I do that to remind you that none of us is a lone ranger when it comes to the living of our best lives. All of us have women and men, sometimes in the shadows, sometimes going off to another life now, but all of us have those in our life who loved us into life. I begin, as Mark briefly mentioned, with Mabel Broom Harding. The immigrant from Barbados who came to this country shortly after the end of World War I, and who at some point, and I'm not quite sure what the exact point was, married my father. It was out of her life and love 
that I had a beginning of experiencing what love is. Mabel and Gordon, I'm sorry, Graham, were married but did not stay married for long. And by the time I was three or four years old, they were divorced. This was in the midst of the Depression. We were on what was called at the time relief, what has become welfare. I was the only child, and this welfare home relief mother with an eighth grade education was absolutely certain that I needed to become someone who could serve the world. She lived her life in continuing sacrifice to see to it that I went to school, to see to it that I had the clothes I needed. Fortunately, I lived in a city where at the time the city fathers, and there were only fathers at that time, loved their children enough that they set up a college system whereby all of the children of that city, if they had the capacity to pass the entrance exams, could have a full four-year education with no tuition. For me, that is a little part of the being loved into life because those men who organize the City College of New York were, whether they knew it or not, acting out of love for the children of that community, and I was one of them. My mother made sure that that was my way, but I want to testify to another source of love as well. My mother after the divorce, did a very, very wise thing. With this one little boy of hers, and with her doing domestic work in households wherever she could find it, decided that she had to find a village for me. Since the raising of this child could not be done by herself. And she found that village. I'm not sure at this point all of the ways in which she did, but what I do know is that Mabel Harding entered the village called Victory Tabernacle Seventh-day Christian Church sometime in the 1930s. And there, my village surrounded me. I could never talk about my life, my development, my being loved without remembering Victory Tabernacle, without remembering that this was indeed a place where everyone knew my name and everyone loved me and everyone pushed me to be my best self, and everyone nurtured me in the ways of the Bible, in the ways of wonderful, wonderful music, and in the ways of loving relationships. 
So Mabel Harding and Victory Tabernacle, Seventh-day Christian Church, are two of the points of joy that I would open up in my testimony concerning my being loved into life. Interestingly enough, there was another set of loving folks who very often do not get recognized in these days. I'm not sure why. I think there are some good reasons and some bad reasons. But for me, another set of loving folks were my public school teachers. I could name a number of them to you even now. Most important for me, Irene Berger, who was one of my high school teachers and my high school advisor. Starting from kindergarten, I found teachers who again loved me. I was not simply a number. I was someone in whom they were deeply invested. And they wanted me to know that I had great possibilities. And they treated me in that way. And they nurtured me in that way. Those public school teachers, for me, are one of the greatest sources of life and love that I have ever known. I would testify to them and about them to my dying day. Mark mentioned the fact that after going through the schools of New York, I was drafted into the Army of the United States of America. I was 22 years old when I was drafted. And that brings me to another point of testimony. I happen to be a very, very outdoor athletic type who loved to run and jump and enjoyed the marching and enjoyed all kinds of things in that basic training that I went through. But I must now add to the wonderful list of those who loved me, I must add the recognition that I found a deep and powerful source of love right there in the military. I have this powerful memory of being down on my belly shooting a rifle, enjoying it immensely, knowing how to hit a target with a fair amount of accuracy, and just having a great time. And in the midst of that, I will never forget hearing one morning out on that firing range, a voice saying to me, so Vincent, you are enjoying this, huh? Do you know that now what is happening is that you are being trained to kill a man without him being ever able to see you? Is that what following Jesus means to you?
And it got deeper and louder when I started developing the opportunity to learn how to use a bayonet as a part of the basic training and how essentially to cut out a man's guts before he could even move. And I was, strangely enough, enjoying that skill. And again, I heard a voice saying, so, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And when they grow up, and your country declares that they are enemies, you're going to cut their guts out. What is that about, Vincent? What is that about? I am so glad that that loving voice came to disturb my peace in the midst of learning how to destroy my fellow men. And I would testify to the fact that those questions were for me the source of some of the deepest love that I have ever received. And I know the love came from our master who asked us not to worship him, but to follow him. And I knew at that point that I could not follow him and develop myself as a soldier. For soldiers are taught to kill the enemy that Jesus taught us to love. It was a hard time, it was a difficult time of searching, but I testify now to the fact that I'm absolutely clear that it was a time of great, great love overtaking me. And it was because of that kind of experience and those kinds of questions that I was ready for the next experience of love. Meeting some strange people that I had never heard of before called Mennonites. I had moved to Chicago. I was in a program studying for the doctorate at the University of Chicago, and almost out of nowhere came a tall, gaunt, wonderful brother named Elmer Neufeld. Any of you know Elmer Neufeld, by the way? Let me see your hands. All right, almost as much gray hair as I have. That's, <laughs> that's just what I would expect. And Elmer told me about this wonderful experiment that Mennonites were trying on the south side of Chicago. As white people were moving out and black people moving in, and the Mennonite church there, the Mennonite seminary there, thinking seriously about moving out as well, Elmer introduced me to some Mennonites who were saying, no, we want to stay. We want to stay in this community and minister to and with this community if we can find black folks who will join us in the ministry. That became one of the greatest and most beautiful callings of my life, a call of love from those who were trying to act out love in the midst of the community. 
I see that as another powerful part of my being nurtured by love. As Mark said, eventually some of us, three whites and two blacks, went south and drove through the south with nothing but love to hold us together. And that became a, a powerful experience. Partly because it was at, at that time that I met another lover in Montgomery, Alabama in 1958 as we were driving through the South we decided we needed to meet Martin Luther King Jr. and in those days before cell phones we simply went into the place where all the phone books were kept got the Montgomery book looked up Martin Luther King Jr., there it was, and we called and asked Coretta King, who answered the phone, if we could come and visit Dr. King. It turned out that Martin at that point was in bed, recuperating from a stab wound that he'd received in New York City. But his wife said to us, come on, let's see if you're going to be driving this way, stop in and we'll see how he feels. We did. We came to the door. Coretta looked at us and in a sense I felt already a kind of loving, rejoicing in seeing us. And she said, let me go and ask my husband if he would be interested in talking with you all. A few minutes later, she was back out into the living room that we'd entered with a big smile saying, yes, he would like very much to see you. And so the five of us descend upon Martin King's bedroom. Martin is in his pajamas with his robe, sitting up against the pillows, and with a great big grin, which he was very good at, started to tease us and say, oh, I congratulate you of having gotten through Mississippi. Wonderful. And we had about a two hour talk. And in the midst of that talk, I began to feel the deep loving relationship that we would know for the next 10 years. I testified to Martin as one who, at the end of the conversation said, listen, and he said, especially to the two black guys who were in this group, he said, you are Mennonites. You know something about this matter of nonviolence and what we're trying to do here. You were to come down here from Chicago and work with us sometime. And for me, that was the invitation of love. And eventually, I found my way there. Eventually, found the love that was in that setting of struggle for a new America. Martin King opened the door for me. And in the course of that time, many other people opened their arms and essentially said, Vincent, we're glad you've come. Be with us. I remember especially Fanny Lou Hamer, one of the most wonderful sixth grade educated sharecroppers that you could meet, who wrapped me almost literally in her arms and said, you belong here, you belong 
in this movement with us. All of this is a part of the testimony of love. In that whole period, I remember, especially as the time went on and we began to develop in the movement a deep emphasis on appreciation of our blackness, in that time, <coughs> another lover came on the scene. And I met Thomas Merton, the great Thomas Merton, who essentially said that he was quite ready for black power to come to a new level. I remember asking him about whether or not he agreed with the black power advocates who said that whites ought to do more listening now and blacks ought to do more speaking now. And Tom said, well, it's about time. Whites have been talking for a long time. We need to learn how to listen. All of those are the loving memories of those who have loved me into life. Most recently, I have lived in Denver, Colorado, and there found the love of so many in the Latino Hispanic community and found new opportunities for growth and development. In that period in Denver, my wife, Rosemary from Goshen, died. And what happened just three months ago was that I found and heard and received love again. Can you imagine how magnificent it is to be 82 years old and find love? I testify to how beautiful that is and recommend it to anyone who would like to try it. I am glad for all of you. Remember, what I have shared with you is simply my beginning of the conversation, of the dialogue. I trust that you will take very seriously my invitation to stop me, to tap me, to trip me up if you need to, and to enter in conversation because I am looking forward to it and I know that wherever I go, the loving dialogue is part of what keeps me going and can keep us going. I would then say, peace be with you. May you have a magnificent day and may these next years for you be years in which love moves into you and opens you to possibilities that you don't even realize you have. Just keep open and you'll be amazed and surprised and overwhelmed almost by love and I will be very happy. Peace be with you.